Okay, so thanks everybody for attending the second uh, Bytes of Innovation webinar. Uh, Bytes of Innovation is a webinar series uh, that provides a deep dive into the future of medicine. And we do this with renowned researchers, physicians, investors, and lawyers. Uh, we do it every other Thursday. So we have it today, we'll have it in two weeks and so on. It's a 15 minute presentation by the expert followed by 10 minutes of Q&A, uh, which is uh, moderated by Aline, who is the medical director at SACMED and by me. So make sure to put all your questions uh, during the talk uh, in the chat so that we can discuss it afterwards. Um, in two weeks, we'll, we will hear from Virginia Hunestroza. She is the co-chair of the Trainee Diversity Committee at Stanford, and she will talk about diversity in radiology. Uh, but for today, I am proud to announce that uh, Dr. Yu Harvey is going to talk about global regulations of AI. A little bit of background information on, uh, on Yu. He is a key opinion leader in the digital health space. He is trained as a radiologist. He currently is the managing director at Hardian Health in London. He also is an honorary research fellow at the Institute of Cognitive Neurosciences at the University College London. He's very active. Um, he's active within the British Institute of Radiology in the Clinical Intelligence and Informatics Group. He's also an advisor for multiple startup companies, including SETMED. And previously, he had lead roles at two flagship startups in the UK. So, um, you, the floor is yours. Let me and share my screen. Thank you. Let me get set up at this end. Are we good? I think that's good. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Go ahead. Brilliant. So, so global regulation, um, the title is global regulation of AI, but the way the regulators call it is software as a medical device. AI is not a, a specified thing that, that can be regulated currently under any global medical device regulation. So I call it software as a medical device. That said, the term AI, AI AI AMD is sort of coming um, into a bit more sort of common parlance. Um, so you might hear the term AI AMD spoken about by regulators in the near future. Um, so basically, I'm going to be talking about the CE marking process, uh, which is Conformity European in Europe um, and the FDA um, clearance system and approval system in America. There are other regulatory processes around the world that exist. But these are the two main ones. So if you are building a product, you want to sell it to people, you're going to need regulatory clearance somewhere in the world. Um, for instance, in Korea, Korea and FDA, in the UK, we now have the UK CA mark. China has the NMPA service and Japan has the PMDA. All of these funny acronyms you're, you don't need to learn apart from CE and FDA, which will be your two main uh, markets. Um, so why do we regulate anything? I mean, you're thinking, well, I built an AI system, can I just sell it to people? Uh, no, people want to know that it is safe. They want to know um, that it's been built with quality in mind. And by quality, we mean documented processes to show that you've done the right steps at the right time. Um, they want to know what clinical evidence you have um, to support the claims that you're making. Um, and there's an element of transparency as well. So you have to be able to provide the relevant documentation to the regulators, quite deep and instructive as to how you've done what you've done um, and, and how you've tested and validated and verified. So these are kind of the main reasons why we regulate. And healthcare is a heavily regulated industry. There's not a single drug, physical device or piece of software that is used in a hospital that hasn't gone through some form of regulatory oversight. So in general, all medical devices, whether they're software or not, whether they're surgical instruments, CT scanners, and uh, are, are under this kind of risk class stratification. Um, in, in essence, there are three major risk classes that the regulators consider, uh, from low risk, which is class one, up to high risk, which is class three. And not all devices are in the same class. So not all software is definitely in the same class. Um, your risk is identified by your intended use of what you're claiming it to do, but also the highest possible harm that could occur to an individual patient as a result of someone using your, your, your device. In general, software is at least class two, but can be class three. It tends not to be class one unless it's staying well away from decision support or diagnosis. Um, it's uh, low risk devices are things that just kind of store and process information and maybe present them in a presentation there rather than actually do anything active um, or decision making with the data. 
So I mentioned intended use. Intended use is the cornerstone of any regulatory submission. And in fact, it should be the cornerstone of anybody who's building a, an AI product. Um, intended use, this is, a, this is um, from the, the FDA um, labeling section, part 801. Um, by the way, if you are gonna be going down the regulatory routes, um, you're gonna get inundated with all these regulatory articles and chapters. Um, so just to get in touch if you, if you get lost, it's a complete rabbit warren. But if you find the intended use chapter, um, it'll tell you what kind of labeling and what kind of things you should be including in your intended use. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing out, but I just want you to know that your intended use that you tell the regulators has to be the same as to what you tell your clients and customers in your advertising, your marketing, in any speeches you give and anything you say to customers. Um, if you say things outside your intended use to a customer and the regulators hear about it, they can take you off market or fine you. So intended use, everyone in your company needs to know what the intended use is of your product um, and, and stick to that. You can't go off and say, look, we do X, Y, and Z if you don't do Z. Intended use covers um, the general purpose of the device including clarifications on what you shouldn't use it for. It also covers indications for use. So you have to very specifically identify the disease, the condition, the environment, um, the population, the end users, all of this kind of stuff in the indications for use. And the reason why I've split the two is because the FDA like their documentation split into two like this, whereas in CE marking, you do it all in one intended use statement. But the key concepts are exactly the same. So here's an intended use statement that I've taken from the FDA uh, a database. So you can download the intended use of any device that's been regulatory approved off the FDA database. And you can have a look at what that kind of statement is. And this is for a radiology AI system that can find intra-abdominal free gas or a CT scan. And we can see that they've, they've qualified the end user, they've included the modality it's for, what the pathology is, et cetera, et cetera. But even in a, in a, in a well-written intended use, you can forget things. So they've forgotten to say, well, what's the patient population? They haven't said what age, sex, or ethnicity of patients um, the device is intended to be used on. So, uh, sorry, I removed that from this statement, but the real one actually has that information. So this is the kind of sort of thing that, that the high level paragraph that everyone in your company should really understand about every single product that you're making is what's that intended use? And then you can only tell these things in your advertising and to your customers. So let's start with the EU, because that's my home territory. Um, in the EU, we have now the EU Medical Device Regulations, the EU MDR, that is um, um, set at a central uh, level from, from, from the European Commission. And every single one of the 27 member states of Europe, apart from the uh, UK now, because we left in January, um, it, uh, uses these, these regulations. Now, you have national governance in each of the countries, so France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Poland, everyone has their own uh, national body for which governs medical devices. In the UK, we have the MHRA, um, and they kind of take on board the medical device regulations. But actually, the people who do the auditing is, are not the national bodies or the European Commission themselves. It's something called notified bodies. These are for-profit consultancy firms who will charge you exorbitant amounts to come and audit your technical documentation. Um, and so they're the ones who deal directly with the vendors. There are roughly 13, 14 notified bodies across Europe who are coded to do software as a medical device for CE model. The medical device regulations only came into force uh, in May this year, sort of midway through this, this big pandemic. Um, there's a, it's, it's basically sort of um, time six in size compared to the previous medical device regulations. Um, and it mentions safety, you know, 100 more times than it did before. And there's a lot of nuanced changes, especially relating to software as a medical device, where they up classified software into higher risk categories because software nowadays can do lots more than software could do decades ago. Um, and it's now um, mandatory law um, across Europe, whereas the previous ones was just, was just guidance. So if you are new to the European market, you must go through this MDR process. If you are a manufacturer who managed to get a regulatory clearance before the 26th of May, you may have an MDD certification or CE mark. That doesn't mean that you've got away scot-free. No, no, no. You still have to do MDR by 2024. So you still need to catch up and do it. So these were the main changes. I'm not going to talk too much about them because we've only got 15 minutes. 
but in general, they've beefed up what's known as post-market surveillance and periodic safety update reporting. So they've realized that software, once it's on market, is not just an off-the-shelf thing you plug in and forget about it. You have to monitor constantly the output. So they're mandating sort of follow-up audits, follow-up prospective studies and things like that to make sure that people are monitoring and are aware of what's happening um, to that data and to patients as a result of the software being implemented into clinical workflows. And the second main thing is, is unique device identification. Before you just sort of gave it your own random personalized in-house number or version sync system, but now you have to use this international UDI system, which America's been using for a while and Europe has just adopted. They've also um, updated with the definition of a medical device to include standalone software because you know, back in the 90s, software really just couldn't do much on its own. And so now you can have standalone software systems. So that is now definitely by law, a separate classification of medical device. And they've included terms that AI can cover, which is things like prediction and prognosis of diseases. Um, and if you want to get technical under rule 11 of medical device regulations, it specifically states that any software that is involved with decisions around diagnosis, or therapeutic purposes is automatically class 2A, but it can actually be class three if it's possible to kill a patient by making the wrong um, assumptions. So things looking at you know, uh, acute stroke, for instance, could be class three, because if you get that wrong, a patient can die within four or five hours. So um, it's, it's very critical that you get your intended use right, and then you find out what your risk class is based on that intended use. Um, I'm gonna skip this, self-explanatory. Part of the EU documentation, you need to provide a clinical evaluation report. So regulatory submissions can be tens of thousands of pages long. About half of it is technical documentation, including a quality management system. The other half is clinical evaluation reports. There's many components. And so all companies need someone clinical, either in-house in their team or someone that they can refer to who knows their product inside out, who can write a literature review who can draw up a clinical evaluation protocol, who can um, summarize clinical data from both literature and your internal and external validations and write a clinical evaluation report. And the regulators check the CVs of the authors of these. So I've seen some companies just sort of hire interns to do it, and then the regulators check the CVs and go, well, these people aren't qualified to write a clinical evaluation report for these devices. So um, it's, it's a very important and key part of, of your regulatory submission to get the, the clinical stuff right and just for the academics watching and um, you aren't exempt from regulation you might be thinking well i don't want to sell my product that doesn't matter um, in the eu um, if you want to place it on market that means to sell it then you need a CMOG. but if you want to put it into use you still need to get audited for what's known as iso 13485 which is quality management systems because we don't just want academics to put their let's face it non-productizable code directly into hospitals without any regulatory oversight whatsoever. so academics still have to um, in europe um, go through some regulatory scrutiny so there are pros and cons to the european medical device regulations uh, we're getting a database called udamed which is a european-wide database where every single product that's approved on market um, it will be registered and all of its safety update and performance data will be publicly available so if you have adverse events patients die because of your software that will become public knowledge and that's a huge step forward for transparency in the medical device sector and there's a massive increase in safety and follow-up as i've previously explained in these new regulations and they abide by globally standard methodologies and i'll talk about the iso standards which they're based on in a little bit there are some cons though, um, you don't have to publish your clinical evaluation and you don't need a clinical evaluation for the low risk devices. So um, a little bit less transparent on, on that front. And you still don't need a prospective study to get regulatory clearance. This is true both in America and in Europe, though this still raises eyebrows by from clinicians. They demand prospective studies sometimes before they buy. Um, and there is yet to be a, a, a set piece of guidance, though I'm assured one is coming, on what data quality validation, uh, uh, what quality of data you need for your validation studies, um, which is why I love you know, helping with the segment because they are really focused on this. Well, what does good quality data look like uh, in terms of validating an AI system? Very briefly on my, my home turf of, of the UK, we don't know what we're doing. We left Europe, even though we're still in Europe, 
uh, geographically, and we will accept the CE mark up until uh, June 2023. Um, but until then, we need to write our own regulations. They're going to be called the UKCA. But really, if you just lift it up under the hood, it's the old MDD that we're using currently. So um, I'm, I'm assured that there will be some new medical device regulations specifically around AI as a medical device for the UK. But at the moment, nobody knows. And if you are planning on selling into the UK at the NHS, get a CE mark for now and you're good to go. The UK regulatory infrastructure, um, they've just changed the word notified bodies to approved bodies because we can, because we're British and we like to change just single words that no one else uses. Um, and there are only three approved bodies and these are the three, BSI, UL and STS that you can apply to to get a UK CE mark currently. Um, I'm going to skip the current uh, future regulation of the UK, but just to say that we might introduce for AI systems what's known as a, a P-plate and L-plate system. This is taken from our driving um, lessons and driving instructors when we learn to drive. When you start learning to drive, you get the P-plate, which means you're practicing. Um, when you get your provisional license, you get a little L-plate, which means that you haven't passed the exam, but you've got to the point where you're allowed to drive around. And then once you pass your exam, you get a full license. They're thinking the same thing could happen for AI systems where you get your P plate once you've done some benchmark testing, you get your learner plate once you've done some real world testing on real world data, and then you get your full license once you've done a prospective study. And that would allow people to get onto market slightly earlier than waiting for a full prospective study. The other thing to say, and this is a little plug for me and my services, is that if you are an international company, i.e. you're not based in the UK, it is now the law that if you want to sell to the UK and you have a C mark, you need to, a UK responsible person to represent you here in the UK. So hello, we can do that for you. Um, also, you need to register your device with the UK MHRA. Uh, if you are on market and you have a software device in class two or above and you miss the deadline of 1st of September, tut tut tut, slap on the wrist, give us an email and we can get you registered in 24 hours. So let's move over to the US regulatory infrastructure. It's much simpler, you just have the FDA and they deal with everybody. And there's no middlemen or, or, or other um, intermediaries. Their definition of software as a medical device calls it MDSW, medical device software. So slightly different terminology. Um, and again, they don't call it software, they call it a machine, essentially the same thing. Um, and again, they base it around the intended use um, in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions. So, it's very similar terminology, but it's like tomato, tomato, just slight nuances in the language. There are four pathways to get to market. Um, you don't need an application if you are very low risk um, or there are certain exemptions which are launched by the government. So, for instance, during the pandemic, there were some exemptions um, for COVID related devices. So I wouldn't advise you getting your novel AI system down through a new application. Um, the most common is the 510k route. Uh, this is a route where you say, look, there's someone already on market with a largely similar device. Here's my studies to show that my device is pretty much exactly the same as that device. Can I get approval based on being like that? It's a predicate device system. This raises eyebrows um, and is slightly controversial because if previously approved devices are then shown post-market to fail or not be up to standard, the FDA is still approving new devices to copy those devices. And so we saw this chain reaction in the prosthetic hip market, where previous, you know, old, old style hips have now been used as a predicate for over 50 years. And now people are bringing in all sorts of new hip prostheses, which aren't quite um, suitable and are causing problems in patients. So the 510K has a, has a, has a slightly, um, I guess in regular terms, in, in, in a purist term, it's not seen as like, um, the best way to get a, a, an approval. It's certainly the quickest and the, the, you know, the fastest into market, though it's not as robust and, and you are reliant on other people getting there before you. Um, typically with new devices, you need to do a de novo application if you are low to uh, moderate risk. If you are high risk, you need to do the full whack, a PMA. This can take two, three, four years to get to market um, and the FDA will scrutinize every single piece of um, evidence that you possibly have. Um, and in fact, if you bring an entirely new device to market that has never had a predicate before and is moderate to high risk, you are most likely going to need to do a PMA. That said, the majority of radiology AI based approvals were done on a 510k pathway based on breast um, 
um, computer assisted diagnosis systems back from the 90s. Um, so you can see why the 510k route was attractive for, for AI companies. The FDA um, is at currently considering um, bolstering their good machine learning practice guide. So what they mean by that is producing some framework by which they want to see evidence that companies building AI systems have followed GMLP um, practices. And this, is, this covers everything from the data selection and the data quality, shout out to SegMed, and then all the way through to model training, tuning, verification, validation, even in a deployed system. So there are kind of similarities to what the UK is planning here with their P and their L plate system, that you have um, different testing at different stages, pre-deployment, post-deployment, et cetera. Um, but again, this framework um, is going to be hopefully out later this year or early next year from the FDA. And I know that a lot of the international bodies are looking at the FDA and looking to sort of copy this in some way as well. The FDA is aware that AI and software can be iterated upon very quickly by developers. You can tweak things, you can change um, thresholds very easily. And so what they want to do is instead of having sort of rigid fixed regulatory scrutiny, they want to be able to you to have um, a pathway by which you can update and change your device for the better within certain parameters. So they're defining levels of specificity for triggering. Um, when you can do that and just change parameters and keep your device the same, and when that might, trigger you having to reapply for a new device and change your intended use. So I'm not going to read them all out, but it's things like if you're changing modality, changing body part, changing the environment, or the use of, of the clinical measurement that you're doing, that you might change your intended use and therefore you become a new device and need a repeat um, process for regulatory approval. They also have a predetermined change control plan to cover this. So you can pre-specify how you plan on updating your algorithm or your software. Um, so for instance, let's say you cover 60 to 70 year olds in your chest X-ray AI, but now you want to cover 60 to 90 year olds. You can pre-specify in your change plan with the regulators to say, we are going to gather more data for that age bracket and run the same validation tests. Is that okay? And the regulators give you a thumbs up and, that, and then, then you can release an update to your algorithm without needing to apply for repeat regulatory approval. And they're also uh, specifying something called an al algorithmic change protocol, or ACP. Um, so you pre-specify what your verification validation steps will be when you want to change your algorithm. So the FDA don't regulate the algorithm or the outputs itself, they regulate your processes for verifying and validating it. Almost there. The rest of the world exists outside of Europe and America, obviously, and many other countries use something called the MDSAP, which is the Medical Device Single Audit Programme. Um, in, in essence, if you have a quality management system, known as a QMS, which most medical device manufacturers will have, if you get it audited onto the MDSAP, it allows you to enter markets in these five countries. Um, so uh, I highly recommend this to companies who are looking at you know, a, a global market for their products um, to undergo an MDSAP audit. Um, and these are the ISO standards that you uh, all um, international regulators abide by. Um, so for quality management systems, you need this number. For security management, you need that. Um, everyone should be uh, aware of the software lifecycle uh, processes manual from the IEC. And there's also a risk management one. So the regulators will want to see a risk benefit matrix. And there's a very good standard for how to produce a higher quality risk benefit matrix. Uh, by the way, the regulators just assign random five digit numbers to these standards. I have asked, there is no rhyme or reason as to who gets what number. So you just have to remember these five digit numbers. I can't even remember my PIN number, let alone this five digit number, so uh, good luck to you. Um, and the last thing, this is something that I'm sort of personally involved with and, and a big proponent of, is that in the future, um, I would imagine that just like when you open a packet of drugs, out comes a white leaflet with all the information, side effects and all that. I think AI systems should come with a kind of a, a label in the box, as it were, or probably on your website, um, because I think algorithms are in an essence the new drugs, we're certainly seeing the digital health market almost going to reach um, big pharma level size in the next decade. And I think that validating um, and, and producing um, information sheets, something of, of, of like is in the example here on the right, I think will, will, will go a long way towards transparency. So I'm telling everyone that I work with to try and produce some kind of high level um, information sheet for their, for their customers and clients, and indeed patients, which is after all, why any of us are doing this in the first place. That was a 
20 minute rant on global regulation of AI. Thank you very much. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Hugh Harvey. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hugh. It was very interesting. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, so now we are open for a few questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, so uh, maybe I can go ahead and make the first question. Um, so how do you foresee as, as the regulatory bodies evolve their processes? Do you think they will keep raising the bar or do you think that at some point they will kind of loosen up a bit um, the standards for approval? How do you think uh, it's, it's going to go in the future? I, I think they're going to massively clamp down. I think they are concerned by some of the academic research coming out from already approved devices, not showing completely you know, the same performance post-market as they were pre-market. Um, and I think they're going to sort of clamp down quite heavily on, on, on this post-market surveillance. I know they're also focusing on, maybe prematurely, on, on adaptive AI. So they're really concerned about people who are talking about releasing algorithms into the wild that learn on their own uh, without the team of developers sort of verifying and validating. And they're very concerned about that. I tend to downplay that because I'm not aware of any company actually daring to do that in healthcare. Um, but I know that both the FDA um, and the European Commission and indeed in the UK, they're talking about adaptive algorithm regulation. At the moment, we have a very fixed, rigid model for regulation. You have once you release your algorithm, it's fixed. I, I, I think the FDA plans to allow algorithmic change protocols and pre-specified you know, plans is a really good idea to allow people to do what software does sort of inherently, which is get better over time. But with humans guiding it under a quality management process. I think that's the safest way to do that. Awesome. Um, I think someone has a question. Um, Kik, go ahead and ask. Hi, I'm Kiki. Thank you, you for your talk. Uh, I really find the PL system, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was very interesting to see how that would evolve. Um, but I have a question about something else, and that is about the different classes and the risk class you mentioned already for stroke, or it could even be class three. Um, well, that, what surprised me is, uh, well, you know, we have the website AI for Ideology, and we have like a whole list of all these products, is when I noticed that for a lot of tasks, there are vendors that have their products under class one, class two A, class two B, and they all do similar stuff. Um, and this is for several use cases. So I know for intracranial hemorrhage is the case, for lung nodule detection. How do you think this happened, this discrepancy that pretty much it seems like as a vendor, you can just choose whatever risk class you want your product to have? And how do you think it will change with the NDR? It's a good question. Um, so what I, what I say is that don't look at it at the risk class based on the condition alone. The intended use takes into, into account the environment, the end user, um, all sorts of factors, and that goes towards the risk class. So you can have something for the same condition, so let's take hemorrhagic stroke, for instance, being different risk classes. And I'll give you an example. You could, for instance, have a system which is just trying to um, process images and present them to a radiologist as quickly as possible and make no recommendation of whether there's a stroke or not. But the intended use is that this is in a hemorrhagic stroke pathway. So that's a lower, lower risk device because it's not making a clinical decision. Whereas if you have an algorithm that's claiming that we will find every single hemorrhagic stroke and quantify it and alert the surgeon straight away, that's a very much higher risk device because you are taking responsibility um, um, from some, some, some human interaction. And potentially if you get it wrong, then the patient can die. Does that kind of make sense? So this is, this is kind of the the theoretical explanation, right? Yeah. Do you see this in practice? Because I doubt that. So that there's another class reason. Class one and their class two B devices in the end exactly do the same thing. Yeah. So there's another reason. Because of the transition from MDD to MDR, if it's of CE mark approval under MDD, um, it could be lower risk because things have been upclassified with the MDR. So there's a discrepancy between the two systems. I would be surprised if you can find the examples of discrepancies in classification under the same regulatory 
Brooks. Yes, I can. I will. I can share it with you later. This is yeah, you've got, you've got some, have you? Brilliant. Okay. Because right. I've checked it out and I've put it in my own presentations now because I was really surprised to really see it really going from class one to two. But do you think it's going to change with the MDR? Is it going to be more? Um, is it going to be harder for vendors to kind of wing it in that sense? Do you yes. think it's going to be clearer with, okay, all these products are going to end up in 2A or 2B? I, I think it's going to be a lot harder for people to wing it. Yeah. Um, and I thought, you know, in answer to the first question, I think the regulators are clamping down. Look, in any sector, in any industry, even you know, not healthcare, anything, any new technology is ahead of any regulation because you can't pre-regulate for things that haven't been invented yet. And we've been for the past four or five years in this wild west of AI and healthcare and the regulators are sort of running to catch up, but they will catch up. And when they catch up, they will clamp down hard. I will be happy to see uh, how it's going to change. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks uh, you and thanks uh, all the participants with the uh, questions. I see there are actually some more questions, but I don't think we have time for that. So um, it was a great presentation. You, how can uh, people reach out to you if they still have questions? Uh, so yeah, on, I'm on Twitter. That's why I, I spend a lot of my days, Dr. Hugh Harvey. Um, or you can email me, Hugh, at hygienehealth.com. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much. Uh, have a nice evening there. And uh, everybody on the, in the US, have a nice day. Um, and we'll see each other hopefully in two weeks with the next uh, Bytes of Innovation webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>